from the Song of Solomon that we don't hear from a lot. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among maidens. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his intention toward me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. Oh, that his left hand were under my hand, and that his right hand would embrace me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the wild doves, do not stir up or awaken love until it is ready. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes. <clears throat> Leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing into the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and call. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its leaves, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes, that room the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies, until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the cleft mountains. The word of the Lord. a way to ruin a perfectly good reading by forgetting your part. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was beautiful. <clears throat> As we begin our series on love, intimacy, and enduring relationships, let's go ahead and talk about the pink elephant in the room. The reading from Song of Solomon. And we can talk about the way it was read, too, if you read it. Have you ever heard a sermon preached from Song of Solomon? Anybody? One. There's a brave pastor, a brave pastor. I had to think long and hard. Do I read? No, I'll just preach from the love chapter. I know that. That's easy to do. But what about preaching from the Song of Solomon? It's not a book that we read from regularly, devotionally or inspirationally. It's, it's not one of those things that's usually listed as a, as a day of reading. It's not a typical favorite of pastors to preach from. And it's a book that across the ages, depending on who you are as the translator, will translate its meaning in a different way for whatever feels comfortable for you in the translation. As you heard it, did you hear the shameless, almost eroticism that was present in the text? How did that make you feel? Let's just be honest. Some of you are not smiling now. <laughs> Anybody how it made you feel? I thought it was quite beautiful. You're going to hold out judgment on me. But when I think about it, I think, really? Considering our prudish early church fathers, why on earth would they have included this in the canon? Have you ever thought about that? Well, a lot of it really depends on the way you read it. Who is doing the reading and what is it about? What does this language have to do with love? We can look at this from an allegorical perspective or a historical perspective. We can also look at it as one poem, one epic poem, or as a collection of poems, a, a, a collection of love poems, like How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, yes? Or another collection, When We Are Old by William Butler Yeats. Or maybe Shakespeare's Sonnet 116 or 8. 
we can look at it as a collection of love poems. If we look at it allegorically, you should also know this. Most of what is written in the Song of Solomon, most of the text is considered to have been, most of the speaking parts are, or, are of female, female speaking parts. And so for that reason, some scholars really think that perhaps a female writer might have written this. A lot of times it's credited to Solomon, and there are some specific reasons for that, but others have questioned if there were perhaps more authors involved. If you look at it as an allegory, which the early church did, and certainly the early church fathers did, that would explain more its inclusion. As early as the second century CE, the, the Jewish interpreters were using this text, the whole book of Song of Solomon, and think specifically about this text, as an allegory for God's relationship with Israel. How God loves Israel and, and the partnership between them. If you look at it from a Protestant standpoint, then it becomes an understanding of how Christ loves the church, the bride of the church. And so then those readings make it a little bit more easy to understand why it was included. It, it, when you understand the book of James, a beautiful book on, on the use of the tongue and not using it flagrantly and such, there were some folks who questioned putting the book of James in scripture. But Song of Solomon made it in. So I'm really trying to get you to think about this. Why would it have been admitted? If you look at it, though, at face value, like many contemporary scholars look at it, they really consider that it was probably a love poem between two human beings, and that it mirrored the writing of that time, the poetry of that time that you might have found in the Egyptian or Arabic or Syrian cultures, a love poem. Whatever it is, it's clear that it's poetry, and it was meant to be read that way. Another interesting observation is, when you look at Jewish history about love and the rules and the regulations that were guided around love and being together with a loved one, they were very strict, very strict. Read some of the old Levitical laws, but then you have Song of Solomon that is introduced, and it presents kind of a balanced, more of a balanced view of the, the beauty of bodies that God gave us and the capacity that God gave us to love. Frankly, I'm glad that you have the balance of both rules and regulations because there are boundaries to our love and the way we express it and receive it, but there's also beauty in the celebration of the sheer delight of being with someone you love. So there are many songs that have words that have been put to verse about love. So I want to see, name some of your favorite love songs of all times or some of the favorites that you know have been out for many, many years. Classics. And that was Beatles? Yeah. Good. Somebody else. I've got a list of 20. I'm not going to read them all. So tell me something. Yes? There are reasons I can't help falling in love with you. We're going to talk about that falling in love thing. Somebody else? You are so beautiful. You are so beautiful. Joe Cocker. Somebody else? Yes. I will always love you. And I. See, it's funny. Yes? We'll always love you. Who else? There ain't no cure for love. Somebody else? Ever is for the way you look at me. Yeah. Uh, what about. I don't know much, but I know I love you. Linda Ronstadt and who? Aaron Neville. It's Friday, I'm in love. I say a little prayer for you. Who's that? Aretha Franklin? Yes. Uh, let's see. The way you look tonight, Frank Sinatra. And I, for my part, will always love you, Dolly Parton. There's a whole list of 20, I won't go through them all. Um, here's one. Sign still delivered. I'm yours. Who's that? Stevie Wonder. And then this one. Lord Almighty, I feel my temperature rising. Higher and higher. I'm burning through in my soul. Girl, girl, girl. Yes, Elvis. Burning love. Let's talk about that burning love. And let's talk about that falling in love thing that said back there. Do uh, you still feel that for the, for the love of your life, right? Burning, raging, passionate. You get up every day and you sing, and I, right? No! No, we, isn't it a shame that you can't keep those butterfly feelings forever? Remember when you first met them? For those who have their spouses with them or not, I want you 
try for a moment, I, my heart goes where you put aside and think of feelings of joy of those that you've loved for those you've lost. And think about, what was it that made you love them? Your heart palpitated, butterflies in your stomach. You were preoccupied with thoughts of them from day to night. You couldn't get anything done in a lost way. You remember those days? <laughs> yeah, and, and remember, your, your parents said, oh my gosh, what is our child done? You had gross colored glasses on. You couldn't see anything but, and feel anything but what you felt, right? Yeah, you were obsessed. And we officially call it falling in love. I got news for you, folks. One of my wonderful miracle therapist friends said, we may fall into something, but it ain't love. <laughs> what it is is infatuation. It's not the real thing. It's, it's infatuation. It's an intense, intense, passionate feeling that we project on someone. They become our everything. Our knight or our maidens in shining armor. They're everything that we ever dreamed of. Um, and and, 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 this, this, and then we, we also fall into lust, this primordial need that we have for love and affection and connection and to procreate. Uh, in this period, as we said, people may look at this person completely differently than you and I look at them because we're, we're infatuated. But it is a short-lived period. Statistics say by those who have studied it that about the longest that that kind of love lasts, you know how long? About two years, about two years. But if it's, if, it, if it's a if it's a, an affair, if it's an affair, it usually is a little longer because you still have this idealized view of the person that you're not with all the time. Two years, because guys, we can never sustain that level of intimacy forever. It takes work. You would have no weight left on your body. You would get nothing done. They would fire you from your job. You would just can't maintain that level of intensity. Eventually, the honeymoon's over. The house lights come on, and we see what we've got, and it looks like this. <laughs> the toilet seat is up or it's down, right? Bills show up, and somebody has to pay it. Children want to be clothed and fed, for Pete's sake. Work wants to eat all of the life out of you. And then, love after the honeymoon's over is this. It's something you grow into. It's something we choose in good times and not good times. It's an act of will, and it's not dependent on how we feel. It's something we will ourselves to do because we know it's right. It recognizes the need for personal growth and allows the space for that. One of my favorite writers on this subject of all times is Gary Chapman. Any of you know this book, The Five Love Languages? It was uh, over 11 million copies sold in English, 49 different languages it's been translated in. 2015 edition was uh, on the 100 bestseller list of Amazon, and it consistently has been on the New York Times list and has been won several times. Because people so desperately want to know, how can we, how can we grow into deeper love and how can we sustain our love through the years? Think about this not only in terms of a miracle relationship, but all of those relationships in your life are important. <coughs> He's written a beautiful one on the love languages of children, for example. Um, I'm going to ask Pam, I'm going to provide some notes for you from this sermon, and I'm going to ask her to provide some links for you to some of his other books and some of the other tips that I'll be talking to you about today. He puts a strong warning at the beginning of his five love languages, how to express heartfelt commitment to your mate or think of it to other people that you care about. That when you learn to understand the love language of those closest to you and you learn to speak their primary love language, and then you radically fill their tank with that kind of love all the time, people are going to change. You're going to have to get sick. People will respond to you differently when you talk to them and constantly fill their love tank. And that's a good thing. So he talks about five love languages. Do you know what they are? See if you can remember them. See, and he studied it across time. He's done. He's been an anthropologist. He has a PhD in um, and a master's of arts in religious education and also adult education. He's pretty well studied. So, what what do you know about the five love languages? The first, work, pardon? Gifts. Giving gifts. Physical. Receiving gifts. Words of affirmation. Quality time. Pam's going to have these on the website for you. Words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts. It ain't love till you bring me a rose. It's not the real thing. <laughs> Acts of service. If you don't wash my car or mow the yard or have supper for me when I get home, you can do anything else that's not love. Acts of 
acts of service, physical touch. So thinking about that, do you know what your what your um, spouses or those that you love around you most, you know what their love language is? You know, you're, some of you are talking to each other. Mm. Gary and I, Gary and I went through this book when we were dating, and, and I brought him back downstairs last time when I was finishing up the sermon. I said, "Can I ask you a question? Because I want I don't want to say it unless you're willing to do it. Would you be willing to go through this book with me again?" He went, "I, I guess so." <laughs> You know, I know that his love language is quality time, and, and Michelle is always so busy with the church that she doesn't give him a lot of quality time, and we sat down and had a long discussion about that last night, and what's behind all that for me, and so we had to come to Jesus, it was good, and I said, tell me that you love me, baby, because you know my language is you can bring me flowers all day long, but if you don't tell me you love me and you're proud of me, my husband, then it doesn't count, you know? So what is the love language of your spouse or those that you care about? And if you want to know what it is, look at what they fail to do for you or what they do consistently for you, and that will probably be a clue. What they fail to do for you or they consistently do for you. Like, do things around the house get done? Uh, do you show love by tending to things like cooking meals, mowing the yard, cleaning the cat box? That's somebody who responds to acts of service. They really want you to do things. Some of you are laughing the cat boxes, I know. Uh, somebody who spends focused time on you, and I don't mean sits with you on the couch and goes, uh-huh, 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 and text while you're talking to them. They are, they're all about you, focusing time on you. Someone who offers affirming, encouraging words. That's my love language, and if you know, I can't get out of any event without thanking everybody who did have something to do with it. it. I can't do it. It's just a part of who I am. And Gary drives me mad. Would you just come on already? I said, no, nope, I'm living into my love language. I have that people, I want people to know they're appreciated. Consequently, if I don't get that from you, then sometimes I feel like I've not done what I need to do. But it's okay. You can overstimulate me, and I can have a greater need to be uh, affirmed than, than is normal and healthy, right? So there's a balance to all of that. So what do you most request from your spouse and others that you are in a relationship with? And that's probably what your love language is. Is it time? Is it do something for me? Um, is it touch me? Hold me? Initiate sex? What is it? Know what that is. Maybe your love language is sung to the tune of, why don't you bring me flowers anymore? Or you don't bring me flowers anymore. In what way do you regularly show love to your spouse or to those that you care about? Your method of expressing love is probably your language of love. What you do for them is probably your language of love. I'm going to have Pam post on the website. At the end of each of these chapters, he provides about 10 or 12 different things that you could do in each one of those areas. If your spouse or, or some friend that you're deeply committed to or perhaps a child that you love or grandchild, those things that you could do to fill their love tank. And filling somebody's love tank is intentionally doing those things that you know bring joy and, um, and love to the life of the person. Hear this reading again from Song of Solomon, from the message. Oh, give me something refreshing to eat, and quickly. Apricots and raisins, anything I'm about to faint with love. His left hand cradles my head, and his right hand encircles my waist. Look, look, there's my lover, don't you see him coming? Vaulting the mountains, leaping the hills. My lover is like a gazelle, graceful, like a young stag. Look at him there on tiptoe at the gate. All ears, all eyes are ready. My lover's arrived and is speaking to me. So get up, my dear friend. Arise, fair and beautiful lover. Lover, come to me. There's my love language. Arise and come to me. Look around you, winter is over, the winter rains are gone, spring flowers are in blossom all over, spring warblers are filling the forest with sweet arpeggios, lilacs are exuberantly purple and perfumed, and cherries trees fragrant with blossoms. Oh, get up, dear friend. Any way you look at this, it's beautiful, it's biblical, it's poetry, and it's the language of love. Whether it's between two human beings or whether you need to see it as the way God loves you and seeks you and desires you or you the same for God, let it be. We came out of the womb with a need to be loved and to have a
affection and childish. Perhaps the best way that God shows love for us is through the language of bread and the cup. The language of friendship. In this day, we celebrate a worldwide friendship and worldwide language of love on World Communion Sunday. Listen to this reading. For World Communion Sunday and the table will be wide. And the table will be wide. And the welcome will be wide. And the arms will open wide. And our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust that there is enough. And we will come unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread. And our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to the feast without shame. And we will turn towards each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair. And we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungry world. And we will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will become the blessing. And then everywhere there will be a feast. Ask our communion service to come.